So I'm here today with Viktor Yakovenko, um, who's a professor of physics at the University of Maryland, and also one of our uh, grantees, most recent grantees, for a very interesting project called Statistical Physics Approach to Income and Wealth Distribution. Um, welcome, Victor. Thank you. Um, so I just read your proposal and refreshed my memory of this. And um, so this is basically econophysics. Yes, okay, that's, that that's correct. Talking about. Yes. And just before we started talking, you said it's basically money is a gas. Okay. Uh, so let me, this is a joke, so let me just translate this from my understanding. Um, you're, you're thinking about the distribution of wealth, distribution of income, um, in the same way that you would think about the distribution of energy states in a gas in, in, a, in a confined environment. Yes. Um, yes, I get this idea actually quite a long time ago. In fact, when I was undergraduate, that was in Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and I was reading statistical physics for the first time, the textbook of statistical physics for the first time, and I was deeply impressed that, uh, that uh, the derivation of this fundamental law of statistical physics, which is called Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution, uh, it was surprisingly simple. It was based on very few assumptions. So essentially, what we, one of the problem we consider in physics is the following. Suppose we consider air in this room, so there are molecules moving around. And notice that molecules, say, of the same type, say oxygen molecules, they're exactly the same, they're identical. And yet, if you measure instantaneously distribution of their energies, and these experiments have been done, you will find a very broad distribution. Experimental so and some are high energy, meaning yes. they're moving fast. That's and right. Some are low energy, uh, meaning they're sluggish. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Some of the oxygen molecules move very fast. They have very high kinetic energy. And some of them move, yeah. move pretty slowly. And everything in between. But what is important is this, that there are few, few oxygen molecules that have high energy. And many oxygen molecules have low energy. And it comes out mathematically that we can derive the, 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 the shape of that distribution. It's exactly like that. Few with high energy, many with low energy. Mm -hmm. When I saw this for the first time, I saw this so general, must be applicable to some to places outside of physics. And I thought, what, what if we take economics, which is surely not physics? I mean, there are no equations of motion, no Newton, etc. And yet, economics is a big statistical ensemble. In that sense, in, in that sense, it re resembles statistical physics. Mm -hmm. And by similar logic, I thought maybe one can transfer these ideas to a different statistical ensemble, to economics, and particularly to this problem of inequality. Few people have a lot, and many people have a little. Now, so when you've actually looked at the data, okay, what you find, as far as I gather, is that this Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution fits most of the data, yes. okay, but that there's a little piece in the upper tail that doesn't really fit. Yes, absolutely. That was very surprising, surprising finding. I would have expected that, well, the whole distribution will be fit by a very simple exponential function. It's one of the simplest mathematical functions. And what we found, we started looking at the data. We downloaded data from, from uh, IRS, uh, tax, tax, tax data from Bureau of Census and other government agencies. So what we found is that most of this data, I mean, starting from the bottom and up to 100 or 100 something thousand dollars per year annual income, it, it is very well filled by exponential. But then we found that the top tail, the very far tail, uh, f follows a different distribution, which is described by power law. So just by fitting the data, and this is in my proposal, one can describe the whole distribution by two different distinct mathematical functions. Mm -hmm. Exponential for the majority population, say, at the bottom lot of the safe, or the, I call it lower class for the lack of better terms. But for the upper class, which is few percent, one, three percent, or two, three percent, it's described by power law. Now, one of the things that I think probably made our referees really attracted by your proposal is that you try to go a bit further than that and to suggest that perhaps this two, two distribution uh, characterization is, uh, is, a, is an indication that there's something wrong. Okay, that there's, that there's a kind of, what you talk about is, is a kind of, I think it was normal, normal inequality yeah. and abnormal inequality. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. So yes, I call it uh, natural inequality because apparently inequality exists in all societies. Mm -hmm. Even in socialist society where I lived in, still there was inequality, less, less than, than in market, but nevertheless. So inequality, some degree of inequality is apparently inevitable. And, but but the question is, one may ask question, what is kind of natural inequality? What is beyond natural? So we make a mathematical conjecture that the exponential distribution, that, that will give us natural inequality. But what we see on top of this natural inequality, that will be something different, will be not natural or abnormal or something like that. And once we, once we did this decomposition of the whole distribution into two classes, then we were able to analyze the trends, historical trends. So what we found is, 
as that, first of all, the exponential part is extremely stable. We look data for 10, 20, 30 years, it is just the same. Meaning the scale changes because it has a scale, which is the average income. Of course, average income in nominal dollars, say, doubled in 20 years. I mean, dollars not but adjusted for anything. The shape of the distribution But the stays shape the same. of distribution stays exactly the same. So it's extremely stable. But then we look at the share of total income that goes to the upper class. Upper class meaning this power law on top of exponential. And we found a highly dynamical variable. So basically it was, say, on the level of maybe 10% or so until 1995. But from 1995 to 2000, it doubled to almost 20%. That was the bubble, the dot-com bubble. OK, when the bubble collapsed, the share decreased. It dropped down by factor of two. Then the new housing bubble bubble, it doubled again, actually more than doubled, exceeded 20%, then dropped again during the next crisis, 2008 and so crisis. Mm -hmm. And now the indication is actually recovering, meaning we have recovery, which means upper class is recovering. Mm -hmm. we, see, we see, we have a very strange situation in the United States. Upper mm -hmm. class is recovering, whereas lower class is, is, is not recovering at all. But so one of the things you're trying to do in this project, mm -hmm. uh, as far as I understand, is to think about what kind of process could yes. be driving the power law part. Yes. Yes. So you talk about maybe competitive markets, mm -hmm. you talk about mm -hmm. uh, uh, capitalist production, pro profits, MCM yes. prime. Yes. Yes, that's right, that's right. Yeah. So, so far, this was basically empirical observations. Now what we want to do with this, within this proposal is actually to develop some models um, to, to explain it or to follow dynamics, etc. And one very kind of important conceptual question that bothers me is the following, is that um, the, the, the share of the upper class discover on top mm -hmm. of this expansion was growing at least okay? sure and the question is where 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 is it going so for example is it possible that the uh, this upper class share grows to such a degree that economic activity will essentially stop stop for the following reason because the lower class simply loses purchasing power so they cannot buy products so there is no point to produce any products because because they don't have purchasing power mm -hmm. and so that has different incarnations including this mcm mcm prime Coming from an from an economics background as me, you're essentially talking about a kind of aggregate demand problem, yes. okay, that might arise because of of, of, of rising inequality. Yes. Um, that that's a sort of drag on aggregate mm -hmm. demand, and the way it shows up in your models is different than the way we do it in economics. Um, so I'm interested in the dialogue that you've been having, I suppose, with economists, okay, uh -huh. because you you say in your proposal that you joined this econophysics group in 2000. But you also just told me now that you were thinking this way way back as an undergraduate. Yes. So tell me about that, how you became an econophysicist. Uh -huh. Right, OK, so right. So that's, that's a very interesting story. So as I said, indeed, I got this idea first when I was undergraduate, when I was reading a textbook for the first time. That was actually a 10-volume course of uh, theoretical physics by Landau Lipschitz. The volume five, like in the middle, is statistical physics. So I got this idea, but I keep it kind of in the back of my mind because, well, I was undergraduate. I was. I wanted to read to the volume ten. And volume ten was the also important volume. So anyway, so uh, I, I, I finished the volumes. I get my PhD in theoretical physics. I get a faculty position at the University of Maryland. So how I started doing the kind of physics? Why? Why around year two thousand? Actually, two reasons. One reason, um, I, I, I waited to get tenure. So. To be safe, I, I did career in theoretical physics. I get my tenure, and then I actually decided it's time to actually go out and 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 uh, uh, you know present this idea. But second reason was around the year 2000, this econophysics movement started. So it was the term econophysics was invented by Eugene Stanley, a theoretical physicist. So anyway, this movement was started not by me, by my colleague physicist, late late 90s. And then I realized movement is starting, so I better join it because if I wait too long, it, you know, somebody else will do it. So I joined this kind of physics movement, but these were mostly physicists. Now, and since then, I published my first paper about called Statistical Mechanics of Money, published year 2000. And since then, I started to propagate this idea because, you know, it's not enough to write a paper, to publish a paper. And I started gradual work to propagate this idea toward economics and social sciences. And that, uh, that's a very, very long journey now, it is 13 years that I'm trying this. And I'm, I think I'm gradually making progress in propagating these ideas. It was not easy, but, but for example, we wrote a review paper 2009 with Barclay Rosser, mm -hmm. a very well-known economist. Uh, so we've published, but this paper published in physics journal, Reviews of Modern Physics. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I also uh, get to know Duncan Foley, which is a very, very unconventional economist at, uh, at New School. And one of our grantees. Yes. And one of grantees of INET. And very unusual thing about Duncan is that he actually took a course of statistical physics. 
he took physics course and then he wrote a paper in the 90s uh, before, before I wrote my paper proposing similar ideas as Boltzmann gives solutions in economics because he knew statistical physics. Now the problem is most economists don't have this background. They have never taken statistical physics. They may have taken mathematical statistics, but that's not the same thing. Statistical physics has other set of ideas, like for example, this energy distribution for gases. So anyway, so, so that's why developing dialogue and communication and kind of, kind of uh, synthesis of ideas, it's a very non-trivial process. Uh, because two sides spoke different language. If I gather what you're saying, one of the ideas of, of, of being an INET grantee is to have a larger audience. So some of this is, is about learning to talk to economists and having economists learn to talk to you. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Being a grantee of INET gives a unique opportunity to interact with, with forward-thinking economists, uh, not just any economists, economists thinking, looking for new economic thinking. So open to new ideas, not mm -hmm. everybody is open. And so that's really the, the, main, the main advantage. Well, all of this is you know, incredibly fascinating to me, a new way of thinking about data and, and phenomena that economists have been studying for, for centuries. Um, and uh, at INET, uh, new economic thinking is new thinking about the economy, not necessarily by economists. So, from our way of thinking, you are an INET economist now, and I welcome you. So thank you very much.